The Roland D50, a late 80s love story. The 80s decade was a unique fertile ground where the incredible advances of digital technology combined incredibly with new artists who pioneered this technology into new music and whole new genres. Being a teenager in the 80s, this had an incredible impact on my musical taste and my desire to learn about how these sounds were created and produced. By the mid 80s, synthesizer technology was advancing at an incredible pace as more money was being spent on R&D by the larger manufacturers to develop truly groundbreaking products. The Yamaha Corp had set the blueprint for this model with its development of the DX line of synthesizers. Taking years to develop and perfect their FM synthesis technology, Yamaha slowly brewed the idea of an FM synthesizer and what its sound and interface could look like. With its release of the DX1 in 1983, and then the DX7 in 1984, Yamaha set the synth world on fire, showcasing what a true 80s synthesizer with the latest technology could be and sound like. Although other synthesizer manufacturers knew Yamaha's DX7 was coming, little did they know it would be the monster hit it truly was, and how it would forever change the industry and music. No longer did people want huge analog synthesizers full of knobs, the new sleek and clean digital era had truly started. I remember being a teenager in my high school band class in 1985 when the Yamaha DX7 was introduced to us. Everybody wanted to play the new synthesizer and explore its sounds. I'd stay late after school to have some time with the DX7, and I even remember trying to learn about FM synthesis and how to program this beast. At the time, my other synthesizer was a Korg Poly 800, so compared to the simplistic nature of this synth, it was a challenge. The other big Japanese synthesizer manufacturers were caught a bit off guard with the release and success of the DX7, but they understood that with the speed of advancing digital technology, there was still time to shape the way digital synthesizers would develop over the next few years. Along with Yamaha, PPG was also showcasing a digital system with its Wave 2 line and forging new ground in how digital images of fundamental waveforms could be stored in memory and used as the foundations for oscillators rather than traditional analog creation of these waveforms. Roland's DCO, to some degree, was also a step towards digital, decoupling from the traditional voltage-controlled oscillators. Roland R&D started the D50 project team with the goal to combine and further all of these new technologies into a synthesizer that was also groundbreaking in the same manner the DX7 had been. It would take several years to see this project to commercial release, but it was a road they needed to embark on as a company. While this development was ongoing, traditional analog synthesizers such as the JXAP and Alpha Juno line would still be developed and released. Combining some of the stylized, knobless looks of the DX7, but on the inside containing a traditional analog design that was a carryover from the 70s. The engineers on the D50 were intrigued by what other companies such as PPG were doing by using small samples stored in digital memory, and they believed that if they could capture the essence of a traditional analog synth combined with sampled waveforms inside a digital synthesizer, that they would have a groundbreaking hit on their hands. To make this happen, Roland engineers invented linear arithmetic synthesis, a digital synthesis technique that would enable them to combine a small PCM sample to the attack section of a tone created with a traditional subtractive synth waveform. This method gave surprisingly realistic sounds, such as a trumpet or piano, but enabled the synthesis to shape the sound further with a familiar interface. Although entirely digital, this method gave the user an interface that had some familiarity with legacy synthesizers while using new digital techniques to make much more complex and realistic sounds. This was the birth of the Rompler or PCM era that would dominate the industry over the next decade. Here's an excerpt from one of the first pages of the D50 manual. The Roland D50 is very different from any other synthesizer past or present and such heralds the dawn of a new era in synthesis. In the past, there were analog synthesizers which relied on a variety of components such as VCOs, VCFs, and VCAs. These analog building blocks were relatively easy to understand and program, and could produce sounds of remarkable warmth and character. 
However, when it came to accurately simulating acoustic sounds, the process could easily become too involved. On the other hand, the next breed of synthesizers, known as digital, were difficult to program. Furthermore, the digital technology behind these instruments seemed to imply a different kind of sound should occur. In general, just as an analog synthesizer would be described as warm in character, the digital counterpart would often be described as thin. Essentially, the two sides complemented each other, one being easy to program and the other capable of accurate simulation. The D50 has changed all that thanks to a custom-designed integrated circuit known as the LA chip. The D50 sound engine supports four partials, which can be considered oscillators or tone generators. Two partials in the upper tone and two partials in the lower tone combine as a patch. The partials for a tone could be arranged in one of the seven structures, some of which that included a ring modulator at certain points in the structure. Thus, the D50 can utilize a variety of combinations of the synthesizer sound generator engine and PCM sounds. Using the PCM samples typically at the start of the sound gave a surprisingly realistic recreation of certain things like pianos and brass. Roland also added a joystick which enabled crossfading between the partials, similar to Sequential's Prophet VS, which had come out the year earlier. Unlike the DX7, this concept was relatively easy to understand, although the D50 was still extremely difficult to program without any sliders and knobs. Thus, like many of its other synths over the last few years, Roland also released the PG-1000 programmer, which was a must-have if you wanted to get dirty with the synth and make sounds from scratch. One thing I like about the synthesizer engine of the D50 is that in all entirely digital, it does still surprisingly have that Roland sound. With the D50, Roland also added in digital effects such as reverb, delay, EQ, and chorus, which gave the D50 a polished studio sound right from inside the synth. This was a first for a commercial synthesizer, and coupled with its unique LA synth engine, gave it a character and sound unlike any synthesizer I had heard before it. I remember when the D50 came out in 1987, and I first heard the patch Digital Native Dance while playing a synthesizer on display at Victoria's Tempo Trend Music. It sounded incredible, so complex and mysterious. I watched and listened over the next year as countless albums were released utilizing many of the amazing presets straight up, such as Enya's Orinoco Flow, David Lee Roth's Skyscraper, and for some Canadian content, Honeymoon Suites' 1988 album Racing After Midnight. The D50 was a massive success for Roland and once again put them on the forefront of technology and sound, albeit for a short period of time, until Korg a year later released its M1 workstation, taking things to a whole nother level. The late 80s were such a great time to be a keyboardist, with such amazing technology coming out month after month, 
samplers, digital synths, and now computer-based sequencers putting music studios into basements around the world. Having a keyboardist in your big hair metal band was all the rage. I remember eagerly awaiting the next issue of Keyboard Magazine every month to check out all the latest new gear and read articles about my keyboardist heroes. By 1989, I'd finally saved enough money to buy a D50. It was a dream synth at the time, and I was so excited to finally own one. I played it for hours every day, and it was the mainstay of my keyboard rig for the next 20 years. Sometime in the mid-2000s, I actually had this D50 stripped of all its paint to make it look cooler on stage. I love this unique silver look, and inside it still sounds the same, of course. During the early 90s, I purchased several of the ROM cards, giving me access to some amazing cool sounds, something that really made the D50 a very versatile keyboard. Sound designers Eric Persine and Adrian Scott created a world of great sounds. The Rack Module D550 is something that I also own and frequently use in my studio. It's generally my go-to for the late 80s sound and I've currently got a great patch set on there by Carl Johnson. The D50 truly inspired me to pursue music and sound design for a living. The crisp and cutting sound made me think about how the sonic possibilities for music are limitless and can be crafted at high quality in your home studio. As a kid in the 80s, purchasing a D50 changed my life forever, and it's the one synthesizer I'll never be without. <laughs> 